Alrighty, in this video we are going to take a look at the visual aspects of the UI system. In reality, the UI system really boils down to two things, images and text. All the widgets that you see, or that you could even create, are going to be a combination of images and text. So everything from a slider, to a toggle button, to a button, to a tab view, to a chat window, to an inventory window, it's just some sort of combination of images and text. So in this video, I want to talk about how we can go about working with images and text. In addition, I want to talk about things like our canvas groups, our canvas renderer, and order and layers and all that fun stuff so we can see how it is the new GUI system goes about constructing the visual representation of our objects. So the first thing I'm going to start off with is the image, because I think the image is really going to be the fundamental building block that we're all going to work with when putting together our GUIs. Images are going to be everything. They're going to be our buttons, they're going to be our panels, they're going to be our sliders. And the way that we can use images is actually incredibly flexible. As you saw in the first video, we actually can do really fun stuff with images in regards to filling or tiling, and we can even incorporate the concept of fixed borders, preserved aspects, all this fun stuff that we can do with one simple component. Of course, to actually work with the component, we're going to need to bring in some images. Now, like you saw in the first video, there are some images that are already available to us, and those images are what are used to construct the default Unity GUI. However, I'm not really particularly interested in just showing you guys how to build a GUI that looks like, you know, the stock, you know, Unity GUI, because well, really, that's not very exciting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in a couple images, and I'll show you guys how we can use custom images with our image components. In reality, the process is the exact same, with the exception of there is going to be some considerations we'll have to bear in mind during the import process. So I'm going to go ahead and fire up a um, Explorer window that's over here on the assets that are included with this uh, series, and I'm going to grab our three PSDs, and I'm going to dump them right into our assets. So I just clicked and drag and brought them over to the project window. So what that effectively did is it imported three textures, because really textures are going to be the default things that, that, that images are imported as with Unity. As we'll see very shortly, however, textures will not be usable within the image component of the new GUI system. Instead, we're going to have to import them as a special sprite. I'm going to go ahead and do that on the panel. So I'm going to select the panel texture, I'm going to go to the texture type, and I'm going to select Sprite. Do not select Editor GUI and Legacy GUI, because that won't work with the new system. If you select Sprite, it'll work with both the 2D tools as well as the UI tools. Seeing as the 2D tools are, are largely constructed, or the UI tools are largely constructed from the 2D tools, it makes a whole lot of sense. So I'm going to set that over to that, and I'm going to hit Apply. Now, there's a bunch of other options we can play around with when importing a texture, such as borders, and we'll look at that very shortly. But for now, we just want to get the minimum in place to be able to show something visually on the screen. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over here to my hierarchy, and I'm going to right-click on any of this white space, and I'm going to go down to UI, and I'm going to create a canvas. And just like in the previous video, I'm going to leave this as a screen space overlay. So now that we're in the canvas, let's go ahead and create an image. You might say, well, I can just go ahead and click and drag the panel and plop it onto the UI, and hey, look, it showed up. It's a little small. Let's just scale it up a little bit. And yeah, that, that would work, but that's not actually adding it to the GUI system itself. See, what you just did is, if you just followed that step of clicking and dragging, uh, that's just going to add the image as a sprite renderer, as you can see in the inspector on the right-hand side. That would be something you would use if you were, for example, building a 2D game. So I'm going to delete this, and instead I'm going to go ahead and construct a GUI image. So in my canvas, I'm going to right-click, select UI, and go down to Image. Now we've all seen this before already, but I want to go ahead and just point out the elements that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, we've discussed the rec transform. Uh, you'll notice that when you bring in an image, it does behave like a button by default, in that the anchor is in the center of the parent. But you'll notice a couple other really important components. First of all, we have the canvas renderer. Now, interestingly, interestingly, however you say that word, um, 
you can't disable the canvas render. It's just kind of there. But if we did remove it, it'll say we can't remove it either. Oh, because the image depends on a derp, of course. I wonder if we disable that. Nah. Anyway, the point is, is that the canvas render is going to be... It's, a, it, it, it's going to allow this game object to be represented visually, is the best way to put it. The canvas render has no properties, as you can see. At least no properties that we can edit directly from the inspector. There are some properties that we can edit from code, but we're not going to worry about those. Because in reality, the canvas render just facilitates some low-level drawing capabilities on the game object itself. It's just, you can think of it like, a, like in a supporting role for the other components that might actually present something visually. So you'll always need a canvas render when you want to visually represent something in your GUI. But a canvas render in and of itself isn't going to do anything, because you'll need a component that actually uses the canvas render to draw something onto the screen. So the component that does that in this particular case is the image component, as you can see right here. And the image component is made up of a variety of different properties that control the way an image is displayed. So what what the sort what what image do we want to display? What's the tint color? Uh, what material do we want? And so on and so on. Lots of fun stuff with the image component. For the source image, I can click this little circle doohickey, and I get a nice little list of all the things that I can choose for it. For example, I could select panel, which is the asset that I imported, or I could select any of the existing assets that come courtesy of the GUI system. So if we select panel, um, we could have also grabbed panel from our project window and plopped it on there as well. So now that we've selected panel, uh, we see we have color, material, image type, and preserve aspect. So let's see what happens as we click and drag this panel around. As you'll notice, it scales in a way that we would expect an image to scale. So basically, what happens is, is the rect transform determines the size and the position of a rectangle, and then the image component will fill whatever selected image we have in to that rectangle. So it's pretty much that, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. And uh, so as you notice, by default, stretching occurs. There's a variety of different techniques of working with stretching. So I want to address stretching first and the concept of an aspect ratio. There's going to be a lot of situations when working with your UI that you will definitely need lots of control over the way that that image is displayed to the end user. Because, for example, I well... Because, honestly, I mean, in the last video, we spent the entire video talking about how we can stretch elements based off the width and the height of the parent. I mean, obviously, that means that we're going to have to take a lot of consideration into how our elements size and how they size visually as well. So what we could do in this case is a naive thing would be to hit Preserve Aspect. Now, Preserve Aspect is a very, very handy option for a variety of circumstances. And you'll notice that it does prevent distortion for our panel. See, if I uncheck Preserve Aspect, we get distortion. If I check Preserve Aspect, basically all it means is it's going to fit the object within the rectangle the best that it can while preserving its existing aspect ratio, which will guarantee no stretching. But there's actually another way to go about handling stretching that's built specifically for UIs. You might be familiar with the concept of a border. From the last UI system, we could specify image borders, which were portions of the image that were blocked off from being stretched in particular ways. See, we can see here that the borders, if we have preserve aspect unchecked, get thinner as they get um, smaller and wider as it gets bigger. This is a behavior that we don't want. What we really want to have happen is we want these borders, these little doohickey things on the left and right hand side of the panel, we want them to stay the exact same. And the only thing we really want to stretch is the center of the panel. The, to do this, it's really just a two-step process. Basically, we have to actually change the import settings from the asset itself. 
In the old GUI system, we would constantly have to tell it the border of a background image, and that was really annoying. I don't know if I don't know how many of you guys spent a whole lot of time with the uh, legacy immediate mode GUI, but when you had to have a border with an image and you used it a bunch of times and maybe a couple of different GUI styles, it got really, really, really annoying to have to repeatedly tell it what the border pixels were. Well, in the new UI you actually specify the border of a background image on the asset itself as opposed to on the GUI. So let's do that first. Like I said, this is a two-step process. This is the first step. We'll go over the next step after this. To specify the border of an image, we click on the asset inside of our project window, and we go up here to sprite mode, and we make sure it's single. Um, you won't be able to specify borders with multiple. Then, when it's on single, we go into the sprite editor. Now, inside the sprite editor, we can modify the pivot as well as the border. And uh, I actually did misspeak here a second ago. Uh, you, you can specify the border in multiple. It was just when I was clicking through that, I was like, wait a sec, this isn't where you specify, Nelson? Just fill the void with words, say something stupid, and I said something stupid. Yes, you can have multiple sprites and set, specify the borders. But, so how do we specify borders? So what we can do is we can change these numeric values on the bottom, and the borders are going to be 0 up to the width of that image or the height of that image. We can also do this visually by clicking and dragging on these green little handles. So what exactly is the border? Well, like I said before, the border is going to determine where the image is allowed to stretch. Basically, we want to prevent the image from stretching in particular spots. So we do that by setting up a border in such a way that uh, we encompass particular, particular bits of the image inside of that border. Now, to do this, it's really handy to get to know the sprite editor a little. So I'm just going to go over two of the really quick shortcuts, or at least mouse movements, that we can use to make this process easy. First of all, we can zoom in, and then we can hold down the middle mouse button to pan. So pretty straightforward stuff, uh, or standard as far as two-dimensional toolkits are concerned. But I just wanted to point that out in case you guys didn't know. Because what we really want to do here is we want to zoom into the top part of this image. Then we want to grab the top border and move it down until we get into the center of the image, which is about there. Then I'm going to scroll out and do the same thing on the left border. I'm going to move the border in right until there. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the bottom border. I'm going to move it up until all the things that I don't want to stretch are encompassed by that border. Then I'm going to do the same thing on the right border. Alrighty, so we're done specifying the border. Uh, what this again will do is it'll prevent the image from scaling our the, the portions that we specified as the border and distorting them. So as always, whenever we finish up with our spray editor, we go to the top right corner and we hit apply. Then we close this out. Now, again, you'll notice that we did apply a border, but it still looks ugly. We still get distortion as we resize this in the x-axis. So to fix that, we need to actually tell the image script itself, the image component itself, that we're working with a sliced image. We do that by going to the image type and selecting sliced. By selecting sliced, you can now notice that the borders don't get distorted. They'll scale um, horizontally or vertically, of course, but as we move them in, the left and the right border don't change, and as we move it up and down, the top and the bottom border don't change. So it's a really handy way for putting together resizable panels, and again, Allowing your UIs to be scaled up and down is pretty important considering how the rec transform is intended to be used. 
already. So that's basically our sliced image. Now, before we move on to other types of images that we can play with, and before we move on slicing up our, our button and our header, I do want to point out one other thing. And this is something that I always like to include in all the training that I do with Unity. And that is that game objects are not special when you create them from a menu. So what I'm about to show you is how you go about constructing an image, an, a visible image, from an empty game object. This will help for both people in, uh, who want to be able to script this, as well as hopefully drive home the point that the only thing that makes this an image and not an empty game object is its canvas render and its image component. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right-click Canvas. I'm going to select Create Empty, which will create me this empty game object right here. The empty game object has a rec transform because it exists under a canvas. I'm going to give it a canvas render by hitting Add Component, Canvas Render, and you'll notice that nothing happens. That's again because the Canvas Render is a utility component that's used by other components to present visual information. Then I'm going to add a component, and I'm simply going to do Image. Then I'm going to take the Source Image, and I'm going to select Panel, and because it detected the existence of borders, it automatically selected the image type of Sliced. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and quickly go through our button and header and get those sliced up, just to show you guys an example of how to do that again. So I'm going to go into header, I'm going to click on the, the image in my project window, I'm going to select texture type, sprite, I'm going to open the sprite editor, and I'm going to create a border out of this. So I'm actually going to specify the border to be like that, and like that. Then I'm going to go to the top right, or sorry, I need to specify that as a border as well. So we go, don't get any distortion. Then I'm going to go to the top right and hit apply. Close out. Now I'm going to click on button. I'm going to go to texture type. I'm going to select sprite 2D and UI. Go into the sprite editor. And I'm going to specify the border. They really couldn't have made this easier. If you're, again, if you're familiar with the old GUI system, this should be very, very nice. Hit apply again. So now my button and my header are done. Let's turn this guy into a header. To do that, I'm going to select him. I'm going to click and drag header from project into the source image. Now we have our header. Do you notice that it lacks distortion? At least almost entirely. So let's go ahead and um, make our panel maybe a little bit bigger, and drag over our header. All right, so now we have kind of a panel and a nice little header inside of it. So there's a couple other cool things we can do with images. Um, one of them I already showed you guys earlier, and um, these these things are pretty self-explanatory, so I just want to kind of gloss over them, show you guys they exist, uh, so that you are familiar with them enough to remember that they do exist. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this game object, I'm going to duplicate it, and I'm going to move it over to the right-hand side. Then I'm going to show you the different other kinds of images we can do. We can go to Tiled which does exactly what it says it does. It tiles the image. You'll notice what's interesting about tiled is it is taking our border into account, which will allow for some really interesting UIs if the images were created specifically for this. So to show you guys what tiled would look like without a um, Thing, without a sliced image, let's select check mark, for example, and then let's select image type tiled. And so now we see a really basic tiling. So we could do this to add, let's say, maybe a nice little texture to the background of a panel, for example, or something like that, like a little grid texture, honeycomb texture, something like that. There's a lot of use cases for this sort of feature. Then we also have filled, which we already showed you guys filled in the first video. Uh, I'm going to go up to source image and I'm going to select uh, panel. 
And then let's just look at the different kinds of filled we can do with it. Um, I can do uh, radial 360, which is the default. I can do radial 180. Radial 90. Vertical. And horizontal. I can also preserve aspect in this mode as well, if I wanted to, which would be really handy for something like a speedometer. Uh, I can change, uh, if I go to rad radial 90, I can change if I want to go clockwise or counterclockwise. So that's counterclockwise and that's clockwise. I can change it which direction I want it to um, fill from top left, top right, bottom right. And I can do that on the other radials as well. With a vertical, I can change it from filling from the top to the bottom. Same with horizontal, I can move it from the left to the right. There's not really a whole lot to say about filled other than, than it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, if you guys have, again, if you, I'm saying this a lot, but it's true. If you guys have ever played around with the old GUI system, you can definitely see the value of something like this. You can build all sorts of stuff. Speedometers, health bars, experience point bars. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, I, I love, like, like it just seems like such a really simple feature for filled, like being able to have filled images, but I can just think of a thousand use cases right off the top of my head the second I saw that in the documentation. But sorry, I'm, I get a little excited about this particular image type. But um, anyway, so yeah, uh, we have that. That's really it. Simple slice, tiled, and filled. Uh, they do what they say on the tin. Um, other than that, we also have a tint color. But that should be pretty familiar for anybody who's worked with GUI stuff before. As you can see, we can tint the color of the panel. Of course, that's a really cool feature because what it'll allow us to do is do some animation uh, without affecting the actual material itself by overriding the color. So, for example, I could come down here and say um, uh, panel color change. I can go ahead and put together a nice little animation thing. Maybe have a little bit brighter. Maybe go to, uh, this is going to look ugly, isn't it? There we go. And then maybe go right there. So as you can see, we can animate the color and achieve some really, really cool effects by doing that. But yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's mostly what I wanted to talk about with the image. Because again, image is just what it is. It's an image. And it's going to be primarily what you're going to be building things with. So a, a little cool thing, though, about images is I'm going to go ahead and remove these three. Then I'm going to right-click Canvas, select UI, and create a panel. In actual fact, there is no difference between a panel and an image, besides what default parameters are given to it. So I wanted to point this out because I really want people to start understanding that the way this UI is constructed is is so that you could build complex widgets out of simple concepts. And a panel, again, is nothing more than an image with some default parameters set up. You know, you can tell its its sizing is different, its anchoring is different, um, it has a different default image, a different default color, but it's really the same thing. It's nothing more than an image. All right, so... Um, that's all I really wanted to say about images uh, at this point. So let's move on to text. So text is going to be another thing that is going to be really important for how we present information to the user. And it is really the second primitive. So if you can think of the image as the first primitive, the, the first atomic unit of constructing uh, visual UIs, uh, you can think of text as the counterpart to that. So to create text, we can just right click, like let's say our panel, go to UI, and select text. And yeah, it's really that simple. Um, and if I wanted to create text manually, I would right click panel, select UI, or select uh, create empty. 
I would add a canvas renderer to it. Then I would add a text element to it. And then I would type in text. So again, nothing special. Text is really just a component that gets attached to a game object that has both a rec transform and a canvas render. The rec transform behaves exactly the way you would expect. Rec transforms don't change in their behavior, no matter if we're working with text or images. So as far as the actual text component goes, we got some pretty straightforward properties on it. I mean, there's not really a whole lot to say. We First of all, we got our text, which that's the text that's that's going to be rendered. <laughs> then we got our font. Then we got our font style. You know, we can have a bold, italic, bold and italic if you wanted to. Uh, we have our font size. We have our line spacing. Uh, we have rich text, which I'll talk about rich text here in a second. We also have our alignment. So if anybody's worked with any sort of GUI framework ever, uh, this should look pretty familiar here. Uh, we have our horizontal overflow. Um, so in this case, we can see an example of, um, of horizontal overflow right there. And then what we can do is we could say overflow instead, which will cause the text to appear outside of the edge of the rec transform. Or we could have it wrap, like is pretty much what we're typically, typically going to want to do. And then finally, our vertical overflow. We have truncate right now, which truncate will just make the text not appear if it is past the vertical bounds of the rec transform. Or we could say overflow, which gives us the same behavior that we saw before with our other overflow. Uh, then we have best fit, which simply figures out the best way to do that, the best way to fit that text within that space. Uh, it allows us to give it a min size and a max size. So for example, if we set the min size to like 4, we would get some different behavior there. Uh, then we have our color. Not much to say about color. It's the color of the text. And we have our material. Uh, with materials, we can do fun stuff with it. Um, we can set up different materials if we want to, using different sprite materials, different lit materials, and so on. And uh, we can, we're actually going to talk about materials here in a second, or I, I, I don't know. I mean, text materials will have some different constraints on them, uh, and you can certainly create some special effects using different materials, but the majority of the time, you're not going to want to worry about it. But anyway, so that's really the majority of what a text component does. Not a whole lot to say about it other than our rich text. So what rich text allows us to do is it allows us to specify some additional formatting values within the text itself. So imagine that you have a chat box and you're wanting to highlight certain text or change the color of certain text, but not the whole thing. What is going on with my canvas size? Oh, my game window is being problematic. I'm just going to move it in there for now. So to use rich text, we simply use a subset of basically HTML. So I can say, this is some normal text, and this is bold. So you can see right there that by adding in this little bit of markup, is bold is now in bold. So we're changing the properties of the text in the middle of the text itself. If we disable rich text, you'll notice that it's printed out verbatim, and the B tag is included with that. So we can do bold, uh, we can do italic, we can do bold and italic. Pretty much all the combinations that you'd expect with that. Uh, we can change the color. So I can say color equals red. And you'll notice that with this bit right here, um, I say color equals red. Uh, that's small divergence from actual HTML, because anybody who's written HTML would say, well, that's obviously an improper attribute right there. But I mean, it's close enough to where I believe the um, analogy is appropriate. So in this case, we're changing the color to red. Um, we can change the color to pretty much any hex value we want, like some sort of darker uh, gray or green or whatever. And it works just like you would expect uh, if you were writing this in CSS. We can also do size. 
So size equals 20 blah. And that's actually kind of small. So I'm going to do like 50. So as you see, we can add in this markup and pretty much modify the parameters that we're interested in modifying. Another interesting thing that we can do is actually specify the material of a um, of text, but we're not going to worry about that again because it's going to mostly be applicable to text meshes and not necessarily the text that we would be displaying here. Alrighty, so I mean that's text. I, I don't really know what else to say about it other than these properties are all pretty self-explanatory. Um, the way that it's positioned and sized is exactly what we talked about before uh, with the way the rec transform works. Okay, so again, we, we've now talked about our two major primitives, our images and our text. And you'll notice that every single UI component is going to be a combination of one of these two things. So, for example, I'm going to remove both of these text items. Then I'm going to right-click Panel, go to UI, and create a button. Now, ignoring all the button-specific stuff in this game object, you'll notice that really all the button is is a game object with an image component on it with a child element that has a text component on it. And we can see this on everything that we do. Let's create a slider. A uh, slider. So that's what a slider looks like. It looks super complex, right? Well, you'll notice the slider has an image for the background, right? A sliced image for the background. Then it has a fill area, which is just an empty game object. Then it has a fill, which has an image in it. Then it has a handle slide area, which is an empty game object, and has a handle that has an image in it. Honestly, the slider is just a bunch of images, and that's it. Really, with the way that the images work with the new GUI system, you can accomplish pretty much any visual, you, uh, any visualness <laughs> that you want to uh, using any sort of combination of these techniques. So there are a couple things that I want to address uh, before we sign off on this video, and that is the ordering of elements and how they appear above each other. And the second is going to be a very simple component called a canvas group. So let's first talk about our ordering. So I'm going to create this panel and I'm going to move the button slide. I'm going to have the button and the slider inside the panel. I'll go ahead and center them um, so they move along with the panel. Uh, move the button up. Then I'm going to change the background color of my panel. And you'll notice, again, the panel is just an image, and I'm just changing the material's color. So I'm going to change it to uh, some sort of reddish color. Then I'm going to right-click Canvas and create another panel. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and center it and resize it. Then I'm going to change its color to some sort of bluish color. OK, ordering is really simple. Basically, it boils down to which element appears above which other element. That is determined by the, their order inside of the canvas. Let me go ahead and make this complete, both of these panels completely opaque. So it'll be even easier to see their order. Oh, wow, that's hurting my eyes. Uh, there we go. Okay, so now both panels are completely opaque. We can clearly see that the blue panel is above the red panel. We can switch that up by changing the order. Now the red panel is above the blue panel. It's that simple. There's really not a whole lot else to say about ordering. Um, it's determined by the order in the hierarchy, and that's it. Okay, one last sort of loose end in regards to how elements are visually rendered. So again, this, this whole lesson has been about how elements appear visually through text and through images. And those are really the only two things that we're going to work with. But there's ways to override certain parameters of an entire group of elements. And there's also a way to apply certain effects to certain elements. So let's first address opacity. 
and interactivity. Uh, we'll talk about that as well. So in this panel, let's say I want to fade it out to nothing. I want to make the opacity of the panel to zero. Well, the first thing we might do is we might go, oh, that's easy. I'm going to take this color and I'm going to set the opacity down to zero. Well, the problem with that is that our child elements are still visible. And in this particular case, I was hoping that they would disappear along with the panel. So we can't do that. So you might say, well, I could just do it. I could just animate it so the panel disappears and then the button disappears. Oh, wait, the button has text in it, doesn't it? OK, well, I want to make sure the text disappears. And then we have to make sure the slide. Oh, wow, that's a lot of things to, uh, to, to do. And yeah, you'd basically just be running down an incredibly unmaintainable path trying to fade out a panel and all of its children to zero opacity. However, this is such a common thing that you would do that it's actually very easy to implement inside the new GUI system within the form of a canvas group. So what I can do is on this panel, I'm going to add a component and I'm going to say canvas group. Inside this canvas group, I have three properties, alpha, interactable, and blocks raycasts. We're not going to worry about blocks raycasts at the moment. Um, interactable is really cool because it allows me to disable the interactivity of every single UI element inside of it. So notice as I'm unchecking this, the button is graying out. That's really important. A lot of UIs will enable or disable many controls at the same time. By using a canvas group, we can accomplish that. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to go ahead and talk about alpha which doesn't require a whole lot of explanation because, as you notice, I can drag it down and back up, and the panel appears and disappears. I mean, it's that simple, really. So this is an animatable uh, property. You can throw it into your animator. You can create a cool effect for a panel swooping in uh, from the z-axis and fading in or fading out or whatever. It's an incredibly important technique um, that'll allow for a variety of different visual effects. Speaking of visual effects, there's one more thing that I want to address. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reset this panel back to white and I'm going to bring its alpha down a little bit. There's a handful of different effects that we can apply to our all of our elements that have canvas renders on, on them. In fact, the GUI system is extensible enough to where you can write your own effects if you wanted to. But a couple built-in effects are going to be located under Add Component, UI, and we're going to have our effects right here. So here we have Position as UV1, won't worry about that, that will affect uh, how shaders work. We have Primarily Outline and Shadow. So on outline, as you can see, I've created an outline of the button. Let's do that on a text. So I'm going to remove that component, and I'm going to create on this panel a text. And let's create an outline on it. So I'm going to type in outline, hit Enter. And now you can see it's a little bit um, a little bit more of an appropriate effect. So as you can see, I can kind of change the color. I can move the outlines around. I mean, honestly, these effects, I, I think the biggest potential for them is that the fact that they exist and are extensible. And you can definitely plug into this API and do your own modification. The other effect that we can look at is shadow, which does exactly what you'd expect it to. It creates a drop shadow. So you can change the drop shadow distance. And it really just, as you can see, creates a shadow that you can change the color of. It's really not that super fancy. Um, it's just going to create that using the um, alpha values in the shape of that element to create something rendering behind it. But yeah, um, that's really about it. So again, in this video, we showed you guys images, primarily the different kinds of images, 
everything from simple slice tiled to filled, and how you can create a variety of different effects using images. We talked about text. There's not a whole lot of talk about with text. You have pretty straightforward properties that do what you expect them to do. Uh, then we talked about layer ordering, which is going to be really important for a variety of different situations. Uh, we'll definitely have more discussions about how to order things properly in later video series because it'll come into play especially when you're trying to do something like a inventory window that overlays all of the elements and so on and so on. And then finally we talked about simple effects that we can apply. And really those effects, I just threw them in this video in this, for the sake of completeness because I don't find them particularly interesting. Anyway, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this video, and we'll see you guys in the next one.